EM Hotep family, you're tuning in to the Pro Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio. And today we have a very special podcast because, like I told you, a lot of these uh, speeches in the Book of Power can be heard on YouTube. Sometimes it's difficult to find. Sometimes it's impossible to find. Uh, but this time it was pretty easy because, you know, there's a YouTube history You could just search the name Bello. Not too many videos you see with Bello that aren't too important. And luckily, this one was preserved. And not only was this one preserved, but it's pretty interesting that the account that preserved this video is called Oncobia. So that's like a nice little coincidence um, if you know about my writing. But obviously, if you don't know about generally the uh, Pan-African community, uh, Oncobia was a word that, you know, we could not only see in Marimba Ani's writing, but also in earlier organization formations in, from the 90s and all that kind of stuff. Or even maybe earlier. I have no idea. You know, I was I was like a baby. But anyway, you're on KWZ Radio, so make sure you check out the other podcasts on this network. Uh, so far right now, you'll see the Harsh Reality podcast and, of course, the Bitter Medicine podcast. But there is more to come. And I spoke with someone who was starting up a new one and you know already i'm already like yo i gotta go listen on to that so make sure you do as well subscribe to kwz radio for more information but until then uh yeah just to support the rest of the programs and thank you for tuning in so today what i'm going to do is i'm going to give you this little exposition this little introduction and then we're going to go into the lecture itself so you're in for a treat. So this is Bayana Bello. Uh, this is one of her lectures on IT's Our Story. And what's interesting, too, is that, you know, usually you might say, Oni, why do you keep saying Our Story? Just say history. In this uh, particular video, she's going to tell you, yeah, I don't talk about his story. I talk about our story, you know? So it's, like I said, it's not so much, like, you got to realize that you want to build off of the tradition or the foundation that our ancestors left for us. And most importantly, you want to build off of the best traditions that our ancestors had left for us, you know? And that's really, that's really like what the Book of Power is about, but also what I'm about and what you should be about as well, all right? So we're going to go into it. And if you, and if you don't believe me, oh, actually, matter of fact, I, I, should, uh, I should just like send you guys the link, although we're going to watch it together, though, so... Maybe I'll send you the link later. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I know some of you can be like, wait a second, there's the link. Uh, all right, I'm out. You know, so now nah, we're we going to watch it later. But uh, but but yeah, so we're just going to get into it. So Mama graces us with a lecture after lecture on IT and her portrayals are usually astute and profound. But she's not a native speaker of this detestable English language. And she won't always capture an audience save for the most interest. She's not an orator, but she's a lecturer. So I'm just going to give you a preface because usually what I want to do is I want to give you guys examples of good oratory, good speech, you know, but I'll have to be honest with you. Uh, You know, not everybody's a great speaker. And that's something that, you know, being a great speaker is something you want to work on, but it's a lot harder to work on if it's not your indigenous language, you know, and, you know, really easy way to imagine that is you know how would it be if i were speaking like let's say i'm not fluent in swahili right how would it be if i were speaking in swahili would i know how to do the same inflections and the same pauses and the same so on and so forth if it's not my language you know maybe i could do it in english you know but could i also do could i also pause and 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 stop and use the idiosyncrasies and all that all the nuances that you develop over a lifetime, you know, immersed in the language. Can I also do that if if I've spent my the greater part of my life, you know, in this detestable English and 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 barely any in Swahili, let alone Swahili's oratory tradition. So so I mean like like obviously this gives you know, this gives anybody who's new to a language or, or newer to a language you know, a pause, and a, I mean, a, a, a pass, and you might say, well, you know, she, even if she spoke for 30, 40 years in, in this language, it still wouldn't necessarily mean that she's going to uh, be that, and, and then, it's, you know, there, there are exceptions, but, 
you know, you'll see. Well, you'll hear it. You'll say, okay, well. But, of course, what she's saying is, I said, astute and profound. So make sure you check it out. So, look, you can definitely learn from her, but not so much in regards to a definite program or plan. And so this is another critique. Well, not a critique per se, but this is another thing, observation that I made on a lot of our ancestors. You know, a lot of our ancestors and elders is that even though we can learn from each other, you know, one of the most important things we have to learn is programs and planning. And of course, you know, in a later lecture um, that I share with Bellows, in a later lecture, what she does is that she explains that, you know, even though she doesn't necessarily explain her own plan or program for us as African people today, she will tell you that Dessalines had a program and plan. And, and really, that kind of stresses the, 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 the point being made here. All right, so you can definitely learn from her on regards to, in regards to uh, programming and plans, right? So uh, she is for those interested in our story, particularly in IT, but she's a phenomenal resource in that regard. Uh, she discusses IT's revolution as Africa's revolution. All right, hold on a second. Uh, okay, so I'm a bookman's here. She says, good morning. So good morning, I'm a bookman. All right. Uh, so yeah, she's interested in our story, particularly in IT, but she's a phenomenal resource in that regard. And so she discusses I Africa's revolution as, uh, IT's revolution as Africa's revolution. And so I want you to recall the law of Ma'at and see its relevance here. So remember, the law of Ma'at is a universal law that applies to everything that we're about and what we're doing. And so I want you to, you know, just remember that in the context of, of, uh, in the context of what we're trying to accomplish, right? So the ethical framework of African people is towards war, right? And don't let Eurasians fool you. So you want, you want to also understand the ethical framework in regards to our people and how, realistically speaking, you know, warfare is a means towards securing one's own ethical foundation because what you're going to notice is that when ethics are in conflict, right, when ethics are in conflict, that the only way to settle that conflict is through conflict, through physical conflict. You know, a lot of times language and, and, and negotiations are not going to be sufficient. You know, a lot of times in the face of, or in the shape or in the face of abuses you're not going to be able to just talk down the other person sometimes language you know similar languages are never are never going to be sometimes language there's sometimes going to be a language barrier sometimes there's going to be a miscommunication sometimes there's going to be a communication error sometimes things are not going to go as well as you'd like it to right and at the end of the day what we as a form of species, as a form of animals on this planet, what we're going to have to resort to is warfare. And this is something that we have to come to terms with as a people, come to grips with as a people, just this reality that if nothing else, at the end of the day, when everything else has been utilized, war is probably going to be the answer. You know, I'm actually I want to I want to I want to tell you guys, I'm, I'm thinking about writing a sci fi thriller and it's going to involve, you know, going to another planet, let's say. And, you know, I'm thinking about, well, what happens if you're on another planet? And and uh, well, I was thinking about this situation. Right. Imagine this. You go to another planet and then there's already people there. Right. And, you know, you didn't know, but you're trying to set up your own colony and they're telling you, no, you can't set up your own colony here because we're already here you know and then what you realize is that this is what you find when you say hey we're the indigenous people let's say like right now i'm in the united states of america right you say hey we're the indigenous people of america why are you the indigenous people of america because my ancestors arrived here before your ancestors did right and so therefore that makes your land a claim your your that makes my colony legitimate and your colony illegitimate and now, if, now, here's the trouble with us as a people, and I want to tell you this. This is one of the biggest problems with us as a people is that we don't think like a nation. You know, 
Wazungu thinks like a nation. Some people would say it's a racial consciousness you need. No, you need a national consciousness. You need a nation-minded consciousness, okay? So, wait, hold on a second. So, what, what I, uh, so why did I say national consciousness? Well, because what that means is this, that when you, like, you have to think like a nation, and so now you're a nation. You're a people who are sent somewhere to set up a colony somewhere, okay? And you're being told by the other population, no, you can't set up a colony. Or if you do set up a colony, you got to follow our rules. They, you, you might not like their rules. In fact, you don't like their rules, okay? You don't like their rules because you are going as a people trying to set up a colony according to the rules that you want to live by, not the rules of another people, Right? Now, here's the issue that, and this is one of the biggest issues with us as a people, and I noticed it because, you know, sometimes I'm like scrolling through social media and Twitter, and they're like, hey, you know what, if, they, if the Native Americans want this land, I'm in full support of that, you know? And you hear that, and you say to yourself, well, that's a people who don't think like a nation. Because, you see, when white, see, white people said, hey, you know, if the Native Americans want their land, I don't give a shit. Because I'm doing this for France. Oh, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for um, England. You know, no, they don't say Europe. See, because you think they say Europe. You say, oh, man, we're, we're doing this for white people. They're not doing this for white people. They're doing this for France. They're doing this for Portugal. They're doing this for, uh, for, for England. You understand? And now you, you know, you, on the other hand, you're of this belief, oh, well, we're going to do this for humanity, you know, which means that you're going to spend, you're going to spend, I don't know, uh, like I was explaining to um, someone else before, uh, you know, that in order for the European to get to Africa, right, he probably had to put in their money, in their monetary terms, or in, in, in today's terms, like, let's say a million, two million dollars, right, to get a plane, I'm sorry, not a plane, a boat, and ship 30 or like, let's say 200 people into Africa, you know, with the intent of capturing people. Right. And, and in our mindset, what we're believing is that, you know, they're going to spend a million dollars. And if we tell them, no, get away, you know, go back to where you're from. Right. We're not we're not interested in engaging you. They're just going to say, OK, that's a million dollars down the drain and then go back home. You know, uh, you know, that's a million dollars a month of our lives. You know, you know, the people who died on board, all that kind of stuff means nothing. Because, you know what, they don't want to exchange. You know, like the reality is that you have to have some sort of interest, some sort of interest, you know, some sort of motive beyond just pleasing other people, you know, beyond just succumbing to the will of every other person. And so, you know, and so when you have that sort of internal motivation where you say, you know what, I actually want a piece of the United States. Like, I actually want a piece of America, you know, uh, like in the event of, you know, like, like they're like, oh, let's do land distribution and let's return all the land back to the Native Americans. Right. You say, no, you know what? I actually want some of this land. Now, I wouldn't personally want any of this land because it's, you know, I don't really give a sh You know, like I don't care. But I but I'm saying that, you know, the mentality where you say, you know what? No, I want to give it to these rightful owners. Right. That's where you go wrong. You know, you have to have some national interest. And, you know, ironically, that's what you see in Haiti. You know, that's what you see in Haiti in the sense of even though they named the country Haiti, you know, after what the indigenous or the quote unquote indigenous people were. And, and really, realistically speaking, they're not the indigenous people. They're just the earlier colonizers. OK, the earlier colonists. But because remember, every, no, nobody is indigenous anywhere else outside of Africa. Right. But. The, 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 even though they're just the earlier colonists, you know, they, they, they shared the same name, but they kept the power. The Africans kept the power. And that's really what it comes down to. You will go, you know, if you're, if you're talking about colonizing, colonizing and, and, you, and you meet another people in that land, then you would want to, you would want to colonize. Sorry, you would want to keep in power. And, and, and at the end of the day, it might come down to war. And that's fine because that's that's really the tool that you have at your disposal. And if you're not using that tool, then 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 essentially you're engaging humans with a limited toolbox. You know, you're engaging humans with a limited toolbox. But all right. So much. Uh, so much for that. Let's see. Revolutionary matron. Greetings. 
They still call Britain Great Britain, so yeah, they are national socialists. Peace, revolutionary matron, you know? Um, definitely always a pleasure to have you here, too. You know, make sure y'all check out I'm a Bookman and Revolutionary Matron's channel, all right? So, let's go. Recall the law of my... Okay, yeah. So, Mama also discusses Petion, but here's where she needed to clarify, okay? Petion may have been a leader in IT, but he wasn't African or black. So, that's another thing. You want... Oh, yeah. So, I said this, he was a bastard, and he was a Eurasianist bastard at that, the worst. So, what's a bastard, right? So, the idea is this. Now, and this is something that, I, like I said, I really go back to this Trevor Noah video, right? Because it was one of the most interesting videos I've, I've come across, right? I mean, one of the most interesting interviews of, a, of an elder, if you will, right? Because here's uh, Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah, if you don't know, is like a mulatto. He's, uh, he's a big-time big TV star in America from South Africa, okay? So basically in South Africa, but he's a mulatto. He's mixed, right? He's what, you know, what this book is going to refer to as bastards, right? And there's a reason for that, right? It's this sense that in America, all right, sorry, so, but Trevor Noah, if you look at him, you know, in America, you'll say, hey, he's a black guy, okay, because America has this one drop rule, right, but what's interesting is that when Trevor Noah was interviewing his grandmother, right, his grandmother's calling him a white boy, and not only is she calling him a white boy, her, uh, well, she said he was a white boy, right, and she says that all the kids would run away from her, run, run away from Trevor Noah as a kid, because they were like, oh, we got to stay away from this white boy, right? And so what that tells you is that on, the, like, from, like, we look at this from an American perspective, right? We'll, we'll say, hey, you know what? If you're mixed, you're black, right? Because it's one drop, right? But if we look at what the perspective was in Africa, right? Or what the perspective might have been in Africa. If you have a people who are uniformly black, and then some outsider, a white outsider, comes in and procreates with one of those uniformly black individuals, right? That community will now look at that child as not one of them, not among them. You understand? And so what, what, what you realize is that when in America... The reason why we, they would say the, the mixed child is a, is a black child is because it's, you know, a European-centered perspective where the Europeans are saying, hey, you know what? We are this white colony, and sure, we brought these Africans over to be enslaved, right? And sure, we procreated with these Africans, but the, that product, that creation, is not going to be one of us. So it's going to still be one of them. And in that turn, that's why we call that mixed person black. Right? So it's really a matter of where is your community centered? Where is your organization centered? Where are your people? Where is your peoplehood centered? And if your peoplehood is centered around being African in Africa, right? Then, of course, you're going to look at the mixed person as a bastard, if not as a Eurasian. And, and so, you know, that's really like the science behind that term. I know some people are like, wait, why would you call somebody a bastard? But, you know, uh, that's really the science behind that term. Now, obviously, it gets a little more complicated. You know, what happens if, you know, this mixed person and so on and so forth, you know, mixed person and uh, African person mix. And, you know, in that example, you know, like you could drop the term, you know, uh, you don't have to, you know, keep it going unless you really want to. But, I don't necessarily do that in this book. What, what, what I would explore is just this idea that Petion, in fact, has a white parent. And when you have a white parent, it's very different. It's like you have a parent outside of this African community. And then it comes down to how is your mentality? Like, how is your mental, if you will? And, and when you look at Petion, he's a Eurasianist. He is, he is pro-Eurasia. And in fact, you know, as I'm going to say, uh, Eurasia is, uh, I mean, sorry, his, his, Petion is the one who's going to betray IT and, and, and put it into the poverty that you see today. But, uh, but you know, I'll, I'll discuss that, you know, soon enough. And, I, and hopefully, I think, I think Bella's going to discuss it as well. So, 
So he's a Eurasianist bastard at the worst. Uh, the people of IT should have never allowed his leadership. And so this is really another important point to regard that, you know, it's really about who is a part of the leadership. Like, that's really what it's about, right? But the people of IT should have never allowed his leadership. A study will show that he led the bastards when bastards and Africans fought together and bastards had their own separate leadership. But therein is the complicated problem, okay? So this is the problem of, you know, there's nothing wrong with siding, siding side by side with another people, it's really the problem is this, that bastards were outnumbered, one to 20 in the population, but Dessalines, right, made them the majority of the elite post-revolution. So you want to see the preface, preface to the role of the bastard as a factor in history. That's a Dr. John Henry Clark lecture. But uh, this is like one of the most critical things you're going to pick up on, that in reality, when Dessalines set up the leadership of IT uh, post-revolution, he messed up by putting in power, like basically two-thirds of the government was going to be these mulattoes, right, these mixed people, whereas they were only one-twentieth of the population, okay? So they were one-twentieth of the population, but two-thirds of the leadership, and that's always going to be a problem. See, if nothing else, they should have been one-twentieth of the leadership at best, if any, of the leadership, not two thirds, not the majority, but overlooking that and the role of elites in a community, you know, is going to screw you over as a, as a people. And this is one of the more important things you're going to pick up on the in the Book of Power. All right, let's going to keep, keep continue. Uh, so another point of interest is the description of the Vodon distinction between Legba and Ogun. This is what's known as an African analytical framework or an African perspective. Bodies of knowledge and perspective can be developed in this way. I also want to say this is what we call African psychology. It's really going to be very, like this is real African centered psychology, not like what other people call African centered psychology. This is real African centered psychology. And this is what I want you to work on. So the last uh, thing I want you to notice is how Dessalines attributes the victory to the people. This is all too true. Even this book, or the ideas herein, as meaningful as it is, can only have the impact it needs. Hold on a second. Sorry, this kid was, uh, he wanted me to... He's, he's in the bathroom or something. All right. So, anyway, so the last thing I want you to notice is how Desalines attributes the victory to the people. And this is all too true. Even this book or the ideas herein, as meaningful as it is, can only have the impact it needs by the participation of people, namely you, Ndugu. Okay? Do your part as a person. Demand others do their part as people. Do not sit on the sidelines. You determine the destiny of our race. You will do the work that leads to the world. Nita. Yeah, too. So remember that, you know, the most important thing you have to remember is that it's people who, who, who change this world, who transform this world. It's people. It's not it's not ideas. It's it's you as a person doing your part, not being on the sideline, but doing your part. It's the you know, you have like I said, you, let's say you have the space colony or whatever I was talking about. You go into space. There's already people there. Right. You're going to. It's going to be up to those people what happens next. You know, if, if, if the people on both sides say, you know what, let's work together, then it's possible that they're going to work together. If the people on both sides, if, if, if the people on both sides say, you know what, let's not work together, then it's very possible that they're going to go to war. It really comes down to what the sentiments of the people who arrive are and what the people do when they get there. Because it could be, hey, look, one earlier colony shows up and they were integrated. And then they send those people who were integrated to try to get, you know, there's so much that can happen. The, the point, and, and of course, this happens on, uh, this happens in the, in the American subcontinent, you know. But, but I want you to understand that, realistically speaking, if you sit on the sidelines and do nothing, then other people will determine the destiny of you. And that's what you do not want, because the way how that goes is that usually you end up on the short side of the stick. So um, here's what I want you to do. Uh, I, I, yeah, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play this video, and uh, you can see right here. Look at that. Look at this on the bottom. 
It's on the from Oncobia. Isn't that crazy? The the account's called Oncobia. I should actually subscribe. So, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna listen to this, and then uh, I'll hear from you on the other side. Okay. Well, actually, IT's revolution did not begin in 1791. It began the day the first white person went to Africa and began to kidnap people in Africa. They did not just sit down and let themselves be taken away. They fought. They fought all the way to the boat. They fought on the boat. They killed themselves throughout the trip. They killed themselves as they get off the boat or killed whoever was tying them up. So the fight began the day the aggression, the kidnapping, the slave mentality began to capture people. Now, and the fight went throughout, everywhere. It's not just IT. That's another false idea that IT did a revolution. But Jamaica fought a lot more than we did. Cuba has much more revolts than we did. But IT, the difference, IT succeeded. And that is what makes the difference. But all the islands in St. Thomas, three women freed St. Thomas in 1773, took it away from the Dutch for almost a year before they were recaptured with the help of France and British Army. The Dutch put the, the island back in, uh, into slavery and arrested the three women. But people don't know about that throughout Brazil. So the revolution is all over. It's not the Haitian revolution. The Haitian revolution is just one tip of the revolution against slavery that went throughout the world and received its first major success in Haiti. I would have to say in the last period, the last string of battles that began in 1492, we have to take three characters, three major people, and their surrounding. We have to take, if we take the men, we'll have to take Bookman Duty, who's from Jamaica, whose mother was a great revolutionary woman, was a, a Muslim woman. And the reason he's called Bookman, the man of the book, is because his holy Quran that he refused to give up when they sold him out here. So the slave. Uh, maker burnt the book on his skin so he was all burnt up all in here but the mark of the book stayed here why bookman and since he was purchased by mr. duty then his name began be, became bookman duty the man of the book of the duty now for us nothing there is just a thing as chance and hazard so there is a reason why this man who's going to come from Jamaica grow up here, become from a Muslim to a Unga, participate actively in giving, uh, being the, uh, the, 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 what do you call, a tremplin, being what you jump over to push the last battle, if you want, to spring, to, to, to propulse, okay, the last battle. So this Bookman Beauty, what is he going to say to us? He's going to say to the Asian people, God who has created the sun, who governs the wind, the clouds, he is your father. And he demands that you put an end to this thing here. You must avenge the wrong that has been done to you. Now, we have no other word from Bookman but that one speech that he did on August 14, 1791. So this is the man who brought the word, the clarified word that must be materialized. Fine. And of course, with this, a whole string of fighting and activities begun towards the final march for freedom. Now we're going to go to step two. We're going to get to a man called Francois Dominique Breda born so-called in slavery. But I say no, he was born out of slavery, but when purchased, as they usually do, they changed his name to Francois Dominique Breda. Fine. He is going to grow. As he began to come into himself, he gets rid of the Francois. And what is the meaning of the word Francois? Francois means that which belongs to, is relative to France and its people. He gets rid of Francois. We find him Dominique Breda. He continues to fight. He gets rid of Dominique. 
And we find him, Dominique, which means born on a Sunday. And we find him to Saint Breda. And he gets rid of Breda. As he comes to full knowledge of who he is and take his role as the one who opens the way and traces the road to independence, we find him Toussaint L'Ouverture. Toussaint, the one who has the powers of all the saints, L'Ouverture to open the way. So, as we step two, he does his job of opening the way and tracing the road. What do we find him doing in the last minutes, the last days of his existence here? We do not find Toussaint fighting to stay in power. We do not find Toussaint begging Leclerc to keep him here. We find Toussaint fighting so Dessalines will be named a divisionary general. We find him fighting for Christophe to have another rank. We find him fighting to place everybody where they should be. And his last word here in Gonaïve to his godfather, Pierre Simon Baptiste, when Pierre Simon Baptiste asked him, to say, so you living, you leaving us here, to smile and say, don't worry, everybody's in their post. The victory is already there. And he stepped onto the boat. So then, Toussaint accomplishes his mission and goes. And then the next person steps on. It is what is called, what they call history, which we call our story, which is the story of all life forms on a particular space. So, the R street is a string that goes on forever. There is no cutting this string. So, Toussaint does his work, and the next guy step up to lead the work of the people that are involved. People from Jamaica, people from Grenada, people from all over the islands have found ways to come in and participate. African Americans, from the United States have come here and fought in this battle over here. And, but all of this is sort of uh, obscured when you have these individual type situations. Women, Toussaint Louverture says to us, women represent more than a third of all, all fighting troops. Children are the first people to step on any battlefield. Where are they? in the his story that they gave us. We don't see them, but let's go on. The third step is when we get Jean-Jacques Dessalines as the leader. Now this is the person, again, when we take uh, all the stuff they say about him is really, well, but one of the things, the man speaks Yoruba. He makes a choice to have all his closest people Africans which as a very humorous person, he called his closest troops who are just come, recently arrived Africans. He called them the Polish, Polish troop. Why? Because he says, they speak Aitian as poorly as the Polish speak French. <laughs> so, this is the man who's going to structure the final blow. This man is born for this, raised by a military woman, Agbaraya Toya, whose name as Tantoya, he calls Tantoya and everyone in that period called Tantoya. This is this military woman from Dahomey who raised him all along and reminded him throughout his life that his destiny is to bring liberty to this land and gave him the proper training in military and philosophy in spiritual and mysticism as well. So, when in this training this man is prepared, the time has arrived, he has been a perfect soldier under all those who came before him. He was an absolutely obedient lieutenant, captain, and colonel to Toussaint Louverture. He has received all his formal military functioning training and regulations from Toussaint. He does not do anything that Toussaint does not ask him to, that Toussaint does not order him to, until Toussaint is no longer there. Then it is evident to everyone there is no other person to replace Toussaint and take the lead of the people's movement, and that is this man, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Now, 
spiritually when we analyze just like we analyze to say and in our own spiritual language to say is a legba in vodun by his name by his functioning by his physical appearance by his speaking all the languages that he spoke by everything he did he is a pure living legba and as we analyze Jean-Jacques Dessalines, he is an ogun. Ogun is what? That is the principle that brings, once you've set up an objective, once the collectivity has established an objective, then ogun bring this objective to quick materialization. That is his work. And this is the mission of this man, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. And that's what he does. He says, all right, so now we're not afraid to say the word independence? You guys are ready? He is going to use it one of the first time publicly on March 25th, 1802 in Kretakiewo, when he tells the people, even if you see me submit myself to French domination and authority 100 times, know that 100 times 100, I shall betray them. I promise you, I will give you independence. March 1802. He puts out his word, and his word is bond, and bond is life, and he shall give his life before his word shall fail. So Jean-Jacques Dessalines takes us to January 1st, 1804, Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence for the island of Haiti. Dessalines never spoke of a part of an island. The island of Haiti. Freedom for everywhere. When he made his security plan, plans for structures and fortresses to be built, he made them for the entire island. Everything he did, he did for the island. Okay? And he also told another very important thing. He says, today, we are celebrating one independence, military independence. All the other independence have yet to be conquered. He was very clear. Ogu always speak very frankly, differently from a Legba. Legba speaks in very symbolic term, and everyone can take them whichever way they are comfortable with them. But Ogu speak in very direct term. He's usually hated or loved. Henri Christophe, when he's going to take over after Dessalines' death, then Christophe, what is going to, his strength is that he picked up all of Dessalines' plans and executed them. Whereas in the West, uh, Pétion, who was president, who is the assassin of Jean-Jacques Dessalines, he uh, 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 smashed everything that he had started, that Dessalines started. And this is the man who believed in the French, who is begging a slaver while president of this country, and while talking about the Black Republic, is begging a Frenchman to recognize him as his son. Now this is the confused person who brings us to a, the, the crossroad of where we are now, that led to where we are now. And that's the continuation of this sickness of wanting to be white, wanting to live out of yourself, out of your own nature, and it's going to be concretized by this thing is going to reach a, a, a higher level when this man is going to agree to pay France 150 million gold francs for an independence that we earned. The year 2004 is important for Haitian for it is a mark. It is a time as far as we are concerned for remembering going back and studying a victorious time in our lives so we can pick up the principles of history put them into structures and so we can begin again to work as a victorious people uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines himself said it 1804 he said look at what you did he did not say look at what I did he said look at what you did he said, it's not the army's victory. It is your victory. 
For if you were not there for the army to hide, if you were not there to feed this army, if you were not there to bring him weapons, what would he have re re realized? Look at what you did. Clap for yourselves. Yes, we have lost this. It's not written anywhere in no manual, history manuals for the children. The children do not know what it is that they did in 1804. If I believe if one does not have a good understanding of what has happened in the past, then you are not equipped to build the future. I believe that if your knowledge of history is just bl blurbs, little bleeps about this president, that president, oh, this one was no good, that one was da-da-da-da, this one was a killer, then if that's your understanding of what is called history, then you cannot project the future. To project the future, there must be a profound analysis of what has happened and understand the whys of these various events. Then you are equipped. Because I believe our street is the, in studying our street, we, we capture a light from the past which shines on the road to the future. All right, AML Tap family, I uh, appreciate you if you stuck around. I uh, appreciate you if you even listened momentarily. So that was the Bayana uh, I know I, I kind of undersold how good a speaker she was, right? <laughs> You're like, wait a second, that was, that was pretty damn good. Uh, I'll, I'll link the video. Uh, I, that doesn't mean log out now and, you know, do all the other stuff that you want to do. It just means, you know, if you want to share the video with somebody else, go for it, you know. But, of course, you know, if you stick around, we're going to discuss it a little further. So, as you can see, that was the speech. I changed some of the language, uh, you know, like I put WP and all that stuff. But that's what you expect from me, all right? Because, like I said, you know, I want our descendants to look back and... And, you know, know that we were consciously thinking about them, you know, just like Brian Abello just finished saying, you know, history is not just blurbs and par you know, par blurbs and paragraphs and presidents and all that. It's a wider and a deeper understanding. You know, the deeper understanding is that you have to make things palatable to the future. OK, that. You have to have the future in mind, you know, when you write a manual, like she's like, there's no manual for the children on what to do. You know, one of the things you want to do is, or even like Desalines, you know, is saying, hey, we only got a military victory. No, we only got military independence. We didn't get the other types of independence. The other types of independence is saying, you know what, I'm not going to esteem your spiritual system. I'm not going to dignify your ancestors. Uh, just because, you know, because when the reality at the end of the day, when Wazungu retells stories about, you know, anywhere in Africa, he does not esteem our ancestors. You know, he does not give our ancestors the due reverence. And we have to return that in kind. And why do I say we have to return that in kind? Because there's actually a st older story from Africa where or actually from Europe, I believe, right, where the Europeans decided to make their devil black. Right. Um, so like in ancient Europe, you know, you'll find a black devil or whatever. Right. And they make their devil black. And in turn, the people in Africa said, you know what, we'll make our devil white. You understand? Uh, <laughs> now, I mean, this is the story. I mean, not devil, but, you know, whatever. But, you know, this is the story. You know, I don't know exactly of the example of this quote unquote white devil, if you will. Maybe, possibly. I'm not too sure. But, you know, I can't I can't say off the top of my head. But all the same, like this is this is something that, you know, people consciously do that if you decide that I'm your enemy, then sure, like I'll agree with you. You know what I mean? Um, oh, yeah. So anyway, I, I should also I said I was going to go back to the comments uh, before. Can you guys hear me? All right. So KW Don 7 says, let me make sure that I'm being heard. OK, yeah. KW Don 7 says uh, during the. Uh, the lecture, he says, you cannot have multiracial in leadership position within a black nation. Jamaica is another great example of this. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's what it is. It's like you're not really a black nation 
if two thirds of your leadership is multiracial. You know, it's one thing if you had one or two, which, you know, some people will say is too much. Some people will say that's a good number. Who cares, right? But the idea that the majority is going to be another people and then you still think it's your nation, then you've, like, you don't really understand what leadership is, you know? Uh, this is why America, like, America can have one or two black people in leadership. They don't really care. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like, I think 100, no, like 99 senators are white. You know what I mean? I think, like, Kamala Harris is, like, the only non-white. No, not really. Like, maybe, like, three. Three of them that are black, maybe. Or, you know, Kamala Harris being mixed. You know, who knows? But the point is that, you know, you have that situation where, like, white people are, like, 90% of the leadership. Or white, old white men are, like, 90% of the leadership of the Senate. You know, they're all over the, you know, administration, the presidency, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, like, if you were like, hey, this is a black nation, people would be like, where? You know what I mean? Like, even if it were a black majority, you'd just be like, where? Uh, anyway, so Revolutionary Matron says, we have to respect indigenous knowledge and the knowingness of the people. They only let sympathizers into leadership because they think they know more. Right? Yeah. 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 Sometimes, uh, sometimes other people think that they know more. And that's, uh, that's what it is. Legba. Oh, I wrote down Legba versus Ogun, but, you know, I'll go over that soon. And uh, all that kind of stuff. And I also left the link for the YouTube video that we just listened to in the description. So if you wanted to, you know, share with other people or, you know, have your own discussion afterward, you know, like scream your own discussion, you know, go for it. Uh, anyway, so well, actually, IT revolution did not begin in 1719. I'll try to read through this quickly because you just heard it. Uh, it began the day the first per white person, blah, 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 they fought. Uh, they fought on the boat. They killed. Uh, they began the day of aggression and the kidnapping, the day whites began to capture people. And the fight throughout everywhere. This is another false idea that IT did a revolution. So, and this is a, this is actually pretty important. So, again, like it's realistically speaking, African people have always fought. You know, in if you when you read the Book of Power, you're going to see that I transcribed some Dessaline speeches. And in one of Dessaline's speeches, he actually discusses how he's copying, uh, well, not copying, but he's giving homage to an earlier revolution right, that also had blacks and mulattoes working together, right? Or maybe it didn't have blacks and mulattoes working together. And I think it was like a mulatto leader was, um, you know, fighting against the French or whatever. And what happened was that he, he, he uh, instead of surrendering, because he got, you know, like, I guess he was outnumbered because it was just like mulattoes trying to have their freedom, Right. Instead of surrendering, like he's on, like he's just chased to a, a ship or whatever. And, and then uh, he detonates the ship, you know? And, and uh, uh, Dessalines, hearing about this, says, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a way to go. That's a way to go about with, you know, like to respect your liberty more so than trying to return to enslavement or trying to surrender to your enemy. And, and so it's like these sort of small narratives that we don't, but, but we don't know because it, they didn't win. That's it. It's because they didn't succeed, just like with the, uh, or not even say they succeed, but the fact that they are not still free. You know, if, if IT were reduced to, if eventually I, the French returned to IT and got it back, then all of IT's history between... Uh, I guess 1804 and let's say 2021, right, would mean nothing. Like in, in the history books, we wouldn't even go, we wouldn't even discuss ID. We'd say it was not a successful revolution. We'd just say that, you know, they, uh, we just said that there was a long period that the French didn't have power. You understand? This is how history is written. It's written in the, in the sense of, you know, like the victor and, and from the perspective of the victor. So if the French succeed over Haiti, then the story that the people there will, will be told to repeat is that they had freedom for a little, for like, oh, a short 200 years, you know? And you might be like, well, 200 years is a long time, right? Or so you think. But the reality is that as you get further and further away from 2021, right, 
and it becomes 20, you know, 2323, right? And if the French are still ruling in that, on that island, ruling the African population on that island, those 200 years of freedom don't mean anything. Just like when it comes to Paul Maris. Paul Maris in Brazil might have been free for 100 years, but that means nothing to anybody today. You understand? Today, we don't, we don't even regard it as, 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 a, as a free land or as not Brazil or anything like that. We just say, you know, yeah, that happened. You know, even though it was free for 100 years. You understand? So, so, so you have to realize that this sort of incident like happens all the time, but the difference is that IT succeeded, and that's something that you know you want to respect, but you don't also don't want to over respect. You have to realize that the potential for freedom, for liberty, is in you. Okay, you decide whether you will be free or not. You know, and I'm not saying that you have this absolute decision where you could. No, you have to work on it, and you have to work with others for it. But but that's really what it comes to, you know, like, uh, you know, she relates that in St. Thomas, uh, you know, for a year they were freed until, again, the French and the British help each other. And again, you might say, hey, that's a race thing. Right. And that's a that's an OK way to look at things. All right. But it's also a national thing. It's a it's a nation thing. And that's really the proper perspective to come about, you know, when you're looking at you know, history or our story or their story or whatever. It's that you have to look at it from a national perspective. Revolutionary Major says, we would say they were abandoned by the French while being made to give them all their resources. Yeah, exactly. We would say that, exactly. We, we would say that the French were on a hiatus. And, 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 and we, they'd rewrite history because, and here's, a, here's an important thing to remember too. This is the thing that a lot of us don't really seem to get. And this is why I liked about, like, like all right, so on the Discord you know, we were talking about China and, uh, you know, I, how when I was younger, I, I thought China had a, like an a ancient African origin, right? And I mean, uh, but I haven't really thought about it since. So I just looked back at the information I was giving and the information I was giving was still solid, uh, still solid as far as that's concerned. But what I, I started looking at, you know, different pages uh you know, in, in Mandarin, I started looking at like the Chinese internet, like to see if they have any sort of, you know, suggestions like uh, along the same lines. Right. Cause uh, you know, someone challenged me to prove it along those lines. Right. So I was looking at Mandarin pages, which is pretty easy to do. Uh, if you want to know how you can, uh, I mean, I don't know, I don't know if I should tell you cause you're going to tell white boy and a white boy is going to try to make it harder, but I don't care. Uh, <laughs> like it's not even that important. Well, basically you would go to Google translate, and then you would search how to translate something into Chinese, like, you know, your search result in Chinese. Now, you would double check whether it means the same thing, because what I realized is that the word kush isn't the same word or doesn't even appear. So I started saying, like, you know, Jared Kushner or whatever, you know, the uh, uh, Donald Trump's stepson or something. It was like, what? You know, but anyway, so you look up this kind of stuff and then you then you search, then you Google search in Mandarin. Now, when you Google search in the Mandarin, uh, you will get pages that have Mandarin results. And then what happens is that Google automatically translates these pages or can translate these pages. And so then you can read through the, how the Chinese discuss uh, different things regarding uh, Chinese history and African history. But for the most part, what's interesting, too, is I didn't even know this, but for the most part, they just regard you as ex-slaves. Uh, now, and, and ex-slaves not in America, but ex-slaves in China. So there's like this particular group of uh, Africans. They were like, hey, we're Africans in China. They're like, yeah, in the Tang Dynasty. So in the Tang Dynasty, there is a uh, people like I think Kula, Kula slaves or something like that. And basically, they're just they're just like dark skinned people, possibly from Melanesia, though. I'm not too sure. But they're dark skinned people who uh, come into China, uh, and and that's really uh, and that's really where that comes into that that really uh, where that comes into play. Now, why would I bring that all up? Because oh yeah, so so I'm looking at oh yeah, so the, here's the thing that when the Chinese are talking about uh, Egypt, ancient Egypt, they don't go back to Champollion and say this is the person who translates you know the hieroglyphs and all that kind of stuff. They tell you a Chinese scholar translated this 
hieroglyph and understood the meaning of the hieroglyph so on and so forth. And they do that all throughout their work. That's to say that they don't abide by the same, like, like the point being that the narrative that we hear about, oh, how these white people are so amazing so on and so forth, and they, they translated this and they were the first to do that and they were the first to do that. The Chinese don't repeat that. And, and, and instead, the Chinese tell you what their scholars have done in the fields of Egyptology, in the fields of this and that, so forth. Now, they still would tell you, oh, you know, Alexander the Great, you know, or the Greece did this and so on and so forth. They would still tell you about those people. But at the same time, they, 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 they don't remove themselves or, the, or they, they include themselves in the narrative. And what you're going to realize is that a lot of the history that you learn is in fact white people including themselves in a in a global narrative and excluding other people. So we don't hear about what Chinese have done in this or what Chinese have discovered. You know, growing up in America, we only hear about what the Europeans have done. And the Chinese do in turn the same thing. They let you know, oh yeah, our reliance on the you know the the knowledge of the hieroglyphs comes from us. You understand? Our knowledge of, of ancient Egypt comes from us. And, 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 and more to that, you know, they, it's also pretty interesting how they break down the, uh, scramble for Africa and what nations, you know, got what nations and so on and so forth. But again, that's just, that's just, you know, why, why, why I say all this is to say that, you know, if in, in the, in the event of, in fact, in fact, in African history, what happens is that there were a lot of revolts. There was a lot of fighting. There was a lot of conflict. But what you'll find is that white people will not repeat those stories, except for in really obscure history books. But instead, what they will tell you is what they want to hear, not what you want to hear, not what you want to know, what they want to hear for themselves. And then you just happen to, you know, hear it as well. So Harsh Reality Podcast. Oh, snap. The Harsh Reality Podcast here. Salute, brother. And happy Sunday. So, like I said, you guys, make sure you go check out the Harsh Reality Podcast. You know, Brilliant Brothers. And I, I'm, I'm waiting to get on their program myself, you know, and, and, and talk about uh, all that's going on, you know. But, uh, but yeah. Um, and, of course, you know, they, they, he, he probably, gonna, you know, they're probably going to write me talking about, well, when are you going to show up? <laughs> I mean, look, I'm ready, whatever. All right, well, let's see. Uh, they took it away from the Dutch for almost a year, blah, blah, blah. But you see that they, they, they kind of just don't repeat the story. So the revolution is all over. It's not the IT revolution. The IT revolution is just one tip of the... So, yeah, she's just saying that, you know, it's really African people, right? So I think you guys heard Bookman Dutty. Uh, they, when I say a spiritual text, because like I said, I'm not going to repeat the Islamic stuff. You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't think our people need to look into uh, Islam, you know, I don't think our people need to look into Christianity. I think that, you know, it doesn't matter if it like some people say, well, it's just more accurate. I don't think it's worthwhile because we have our own tradition and our own text. So, you know, there's no reason for us to go, you know, chasing ghosts in a sense, you know, uh, and, and, you know, risking the confusion. You know, if you're like a scholar of Wazungu thought, then sure, go for it. You know, go try to learn. But, you know, in this book, I just say Central Eurasian because that's where they are. They're in Central Eurasia. And then you kind of pick up on that, you know. Uh, so that's Bookman Dutty. Uh, comes from Jamaica. I'm on who created the sun. And you see, and of course, you see, I, I changed the dates too because, you know, who cares? Uh, so is this the man who brought the word? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, and I'm just skipping through because you guys heard the lecture earlier. Um you guys heard the lecture earlier, so I'm not going to, like, necessarily read word for word, bar for bar, you know. Uh, Francis Dominique, uh, Breda, Job, Toussaint, we find him. The so this is pretty interesting, too. Uh, he puts Dessalines into that position. And here's what's interesting. Toussaint Louverture, he starts off as just, like, he, he. if you know about the Haitian Revolution, he doesn't join for a few months, you know. So there's like months of fighting, months of revolt, and he kind of just sits back. And this is understandable. It's like right now there are riots in South Africa, right? And if the riots... Now, here's what happens. If you have riots or revolts, you know, anywhere, right? Or looting anywhere, you know, that happens and then it's shut down. You know, you know the authorities are going to shut it down. So 
in the case of the early Haitian Revolution, you might have had, you know, like I said, Bookman might have, Bookman and Fatima, obviously, uh, organized this uh, this revolt, you know, this, this rebellion, and it happens, and it's, it's going on. And then, you know, like, it's happening in, like, one particular locale or a few locales, but it's not that serious. It's not really going to overrun the country. Then the, it starts lasting longer than you would think, and then the French... Uh, join in and the British join in the Portuguese join in and and I don't know to how long it took Toussaint to join but eventually and of course eventually some people some Africans are enrolled in the French army some Africans are enrolled in the British army some Africans are enrolled in the Portuguese army and what's even more important is that a lot of these armies came in to say, you know what, after we quell this situation, we're going to have our own colonies here. It's really a national interest. You know, it's really a national interest, uh, you know, because you're disrupting the trade, you're disrupting this, and then there's so much sugar and there's so much whatever, right? There's so much to, to, to gain on in these colonies. And so, you know, eventually Toussaint does join this revolt. And, and like she says elsewhere, you know, African-Americans or Jamaicans or, or Dutch, like people from outside of Haiti also join in the fight that black people are taking. So, you know, to parallel that and just to make it seem more relatable, let's say this looting or this shooting inside of inside of South Africa continues to the point where, you know, like it's going on for months. Now there's going to be now the hero of South Africa. Right. The Toussaint of Africa might be uh, of South Africa might be like sitting back like I'm not going to join this fight because I don't know where it's going. It's probably not going to go anywhere. But after months, they might say, you know what? Sure. You know, I'll, I'll try to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll cast my lot here. And like I said, you know, you might have people from America saying, you know what? Let's go over there. People from Jamaica saying we got to go there and fight for the freedom and the liberation of South Africa. And people from this is what was happening. This is what Haiti was like, you know. Now, of course, these 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 rebel, these rebellions, and these revolts, these riots might not amount to anything. Kind of like, I think it was like last year, right? Last year when there was riots in America, and it didn't amount to anything. And there was even like this organization. I think it was like NFA. I think like not effing around, right? <laughs> you know. Oh, NFAC, right? Not fucking around coalition, right? And they showed up armed, you know? But, of course, they were just like, you know, some people were saying they were just playing around. Like, not playing around, but, you know, they weren't really prepared to, you know, do anything. But, again, like, that, it really comes to the question of, you know, why are you, like, how long will you sideline? Or when, when, is, when is it time, you know? Because that's something that we don't really get. It's like, when is it time? Uh, and of course, some people might say it's always time, but of course, it's not always time. You know what I mean? Like you might have a revolt or you might have riots that don't amount to anything like we had in America, right? Where they don't amount to anything. Uh, not, not, and I don't mean like that's what happens in America. I mean, like I'm talking about last year where, you know, you had these riots and, and you had the NFA, FAC and you had the armed black men and all that kind of stuff. And then the guy just gets arrested like on a real easy tip. You know, they just like invited him to. Uh, a, a convention, I think, or like a Republican convention, and then just arrested him like that, you know, uh, like like just like that. So it's, uh, you know, it really it really comes down to like how long will you be on the sidelines? But and and it's not to say that it's a bad thing to be on the sidelines as long as you you join the fight eventually. Now Toussaint, I I don't know if you guys remember, but Toussaint in the early revolution was like defending his uh, enslavers' land, you know. And he was just the horseman, you know, he was like the horseman, like the, like, but he was like, he like, I think he was in charge of the stables, but he was like defending the uh, enslaver's land, which is kind of awkward, you know, like you see people like revolting all around you and you're like, hey, don't come here, don't come to this plantation. But eventually, of course, he leaves, which is a good thing. Um, and, and it's known that he also studied, uh, he also was like a, a deep reader, if, if you will. Uh, but yeah, Toussaint Louverture, he so on and so forth, represented... They said children uh, represented people. First, did some on the battlefield, and women uh, were among one third. You know, this is pretty interesting. The fact that Dessaline spoke Yoruba, right? Because uh, if you guys remember from that other podcast, uh, how this person was saying that Yoruba are so uh, 
if they end up in the leadership position. But yeah, but it's interesting too. So he's he speaks Yoruba, but the woman who trains him is from Dahomey, you know. And and of course, you know, later on they're talking about Vodon and all that, and you know that has a relationship to. Uh, well, I mean, it could be any of them, really. But, but like, it could be either of them. But, uh, but you know, Ogun. Like, we know Ogun from, uh, I want to say Yoruba, but we also know him from Dahomey. So, you know, that's pretty interesting. Uh, perfect soldier. So, yeah, but also, this is another thing to remember, too. That when it comes to warfare, you know, it's about rank as well. You know? It's about rank and obedience and discipline. You know? Uh, Desaline's... Like, the issue that we have as a people today is that we do not have that structure. We do not have that discipline, you know? And, and like, I don't know if you guys have read or watched The Spook Who Sat By The Door. But in The Spook Who Sat By The Door, uh, the brother says, you know, you have, you have a structure. He says, you, you have this structure so that when they take out the leader, right, somebody, like, two people down... Can take their place, you know. And so what you have with the NFAC, right? Like I said, you know, they took out the leader easily, and then like the, the organization dispersed more or less. You know, maybe it's still active. I don't know, but but they don't have the impact or the influence that they had when when they had this leader. And like it's okay to go underground, you know. And like I said, you know, history can be told in such a way that you know, whereas we may at at the moment be like where they at, you know, they could, like, if they show up, they resurface in the future, we'd be like, oh, that's where they were. You know what I mean? Uh, or they could be like, they don't resurface in the future, and we'd just say, well, you know, it, you know, what happened. You know, something happened. But that's how history is. But either way, Desalines as the, uh, as the perfect soldier, as the, uh, as the obedient and the disciplined, that's really what it comes down to. Just following orders as a group of people and going on to battlefields and, 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 and following orders on the battlefields and, and accepting the possibility of loss, you know, but also the possibility, because the possibility of gain, you know, and that's really like you fight for the, like you, you stake the ability to be, like you stake the possibility of loss for the potential of gain, you know, and, and these people were looking for a gain such as freedom, you know, and that's what it was comes down to. Now, this is the one I really liked, the uh, Ogon versus De Legba conversation. Uh, Legba as a, uh, as you know, that rational, that speaker, the uh, orator, whatever, and, and Ogon as the, as the, as the one who uh, like brings an objective to fold. You know, that's what I I thought that was like. That's real African psychology that I think that we should, as an African people explore more deeply um uh, and then we're gonna just jump through because like i said you're, you already heard this so it's not like it's gonna it's gonna be any different if i just repeat it uh christophe christophe and petion so here's another thing so like i said petion if you look at the haitian constitution you're going to see petion's name in the uh in the uh in the, in the, like, the first, like, the preamble, okay? So, in the preamble, like, the preamble is, like, the most important part of any constitution, okay? In any constitution, and this is why, like, I can't just write a constitution, because it doesn't make any sense. A constitution is going to be an agreement of different people, usually, like, the, the people who are going to be in charge, the elites, and so on and so forth, right? But it's an agreement between different people on how to behave amongst themselves, right? And so, whoever is including in that included in that circle is going to be uh, a part of that leadership. Like it's 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 like the constitution is staked on those people in a sense, right? And so and, and those are the people of reputation of 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 so on and so forth. Because you don't want you don't want uh like like it has to be people of reputation. Like like in the sense of uh you know if if some random people just showed up and said, here's the Constitution, right? And you're going to say, well, I don't abide by that Constitution, you know? And they're going to like, why not? And you're like, because I don't know any of you people, right? Whereas if on the Constitution it's, you know, Desalines, you know, Petion, Christophe, 
uh, Toussaint, you know, all these people, and you're like, oh, yeah, Toussaint, I know that person, you know, or, or Desalines, I know that person, that person fought for our, our freedom. Sure, I think this is a legitimate constitution to follow, you know? Now, obviously, saying that, you say to yourself, well, why wouldn't they include Pantheon if he were a general and if, you know, so on and so forth? But, again, one of the more important things you're going to realize is that that's, 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 like, that's one of the fundamental drawbacks of of conflict of war of fighting of winning of victory you know one of there's a drawback in victory in the sense of when you are victorious now the people who fought the hardest and the bravest are going to have to have a reward you know so like let's say if 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 like i said with the south africa thing right let's say south africa is you know like people go down to south africa but and we go to fight for the freedom of black people sure now, let's say you're from India and you decide to go down to South Africa and fight for the freedom of black people. But you do in such a way that, let's say, you know, it takes 20,000 soldiers or whatever. Right. And uh, no, no, sorry. 200,000 soldiers it takes 200,000 soldiers. And like India. You know, like like we're fighting with 200,000 soldiers. Then in India, some Indian person says, you know, we're going to we're going to really help, you know, this anti white, you know, whatever. And they send an additional 100,000 soldiers. Okay, 100,000 soldiers. So they're the two-thirds of the... Let's say one-third of the army, right? Because it's 300,000. And then the victory is after that, right? Now, this Indian person, you're going to want to, as a nation, be like, okay, well, yeah. Like, what can we do for these Indians? You understand? Uh, and if they're like one-third of the military, you know, you know, you can expect them to want a lot or expect to give them a lot. Now, if you give them too much... You're going to end up with, you know, South India. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you're going to end up with South India. And, and that's what happened with regard to IT. Like, you have to realize that as well, that in IT, you know, two-thirds of the government. This is from uh, Irritated Genie, okay? But two-thirds of the government is going to be mulatto, right? Uh, now, did mulattoes fight side-by-side side with African people? Yes. Were mulattoes... Uh, possibly normally better qualified uh, than enslaved Africans? Possibly. I don't know. I couldn't tell you exactly. Like, they, they were probably less enslaved and probably had better positions in IT before the revolution, right? However, if you, like, like it really comes down to what is, what are you supposed to do next, right? Now, what Dessalines conclusion what desolate solution was and that's why you have to be analytical of, of the past what desolate solution was was to be the emperor you know and have this absolute power but he would also have like a council and and this council would be where the concessions are to these other people in the sense that the council was mostly mulatto okay now what happens now, because like the Constitution, like I said, the Constitution had protections for the emperor. You know, the emperor's wife was to be financed after he passed and his emperor's children were to be promoted it higher in the military, you know, so on and so forth. You know, like just on merit of being the emperor's child. And then the, the, the council members killed the emperor. You understand? Like this is the risk that you take. Because you're saying to yourself, hey, look, I made this concession, you know, and at least, you know, we'll still have black power because the emperor is going to have so much power and the emperor is black. But then when they kill the emperor, then they as a people, like as the council then becomes the presidency, you know. And so IT is broken up into two different parts. Christophe is part. If you look at the John Henry Clark speech or if you read it in the book, uh, Christophe is... Uh, half is uh, well to do, well done, you know, well organized. And Petion is is poor and impoverished and corrupt. And then Petion does what the unthinkable and invites the French, uh, more or less, but also says agrees to pay the French 150 million francs. And now, like 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 they say, 100 million, 50 million gold francs. And like we say in the, you know, today, we're like, oh, the Haitians, why did they do that? Blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, the Haitians didn't do this. And it comes down to people. Like I said, it comes down to people. Because the reality is that if, if Petion never had a say, or if Petion never killed Dessalines, you, you wouldn't even hear about this 150 million francs. 
right? If 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 after Petion killed Esselines, he was he was punished by the people, and 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 Christophe took over IT. You probably never hear about this hundred fifty million francs. You know, it really comes down to people and what we do and how we how we engage and how we interact. But but realistically speaking, the biggest decision at at play here was making the council a majority mulatto. You know, not to say there's anything wrong with you know, mulattoes, mulatto per se, but they were Eurasianist mulattoes, which, which made it even worse. Uh, Amal Bookman says, the people of Yoruba and the Hame were related ethnic groups. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, that's that. So blah, 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 children. Let's see. I believe. Okay. So here's the, here's the last paragraph, I guess. So, and then I'll be out of you here. Uh, to feed his family. Oh, yeah, yeah. So like, I no, no, sorry. Second to last paragraph. So I like this paragraph too. Because he says, it's not the army's victory, it is your victory. For if you were to not be there for the army to hide, if you were not there to feed his army, if you were not there to bring him weapons, what would he have realized? Look at what you did. Clap for yourselves, right? This is important for in terms of guerrilla warfare, you know? Guerrilla warfare utilizes the people, you know? It says that I'm going to attack... This like like I there's this there's this building in in Brooklyn right there it's rumored right that if a black man commits murder right he can dodge the police for like twenty years you know like he could dodge the police for years because the way how the building like it's an old building the way it's structured is that you can like climb through the ventilation shafts and so on and so you know like basically uh, and 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 here's the thing though. It's a populated building, okay? It's a building that people are still using, you know. Like, like it's it's a residential, like it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a apartment complex, right? But you're able to hide out in this building, and there's probably you know a number of people hiding out in this building. And the reason why you're able to hide in this building, though, the main reason is because the people there will like like look past you hiding. You understand? Like the people there won't turn you in. Now, and here's another thing too. It's like, okay, like let's say you're hiding in a building. You can't go out to the store. You can't, you can't go get food. You know, if you're hiding out for 20 years, you're, you're not, you know what I mean? So in order to do that, you need the cooperation of the people in the community to like feed you, to bring you food, to, to this and so forth, to go to the store for you. So somehow you're making money. How are you making money? I have no idea. But you're making money. Uh, and, you know, shoot, I want to know how you make money hiding a building. You know, <laughs> shit, that might, that might come in handy for the future. But, but the point is that uh, that's, that's, that's what, like, that's how guerrilla warfare is. You know? Uh, it's the same when, when the Mau Mau were doing the revolution. A lot of the, a lot of what made it possible was the fact that the population itself had sympathizers and of course they were unbeknownst to the authorities you understand or oh, sorry when i say the authorities i mean unbeknownst to the enemies you know and that's really where it comes down to that you have to like like it's the people and the like 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 it's the people and the military that works hand in hand you know the people give the military the army the especially guerrilla warfare guerrilla war they give the army opportunities to hide. They give the army food. They give the army weapons. And, and here's the thing. You might say, well, no, that's just... That. And when I say guerrilla warfare as a correction, you might say, well, that's just guerrilla warfare. It's not really just guerrilla warfare. In regular uh, American military... Uh, all right, sorry, not military. Sorry, conventional war, right? Or traditional war, if you will, right? Uh, well, Wazungu traditional, right? But anyway, uh, in conventional warfare, you still have the people feeding the military you still have the people uh hiding the military you still have the people sacrificing for the military and this is like what sun Tzu was talking about as to why wars don't like why you don't want to have perpetual warfare you know and why you want to win wars quickly because the people if you're burdening them they will revolt and say why are we doing this this is like you're overtaxing us now america makes it work because america gets pure, like so much riches from war you know it just it just like it gets to exploit other parts of the world out of warfare but you know 
and this is why you know you want to attack the morale of war, and that's what happened with regards to Vietnam when they started showing images of you know young people dying for absolutely nothing, uh, you know just for wealth and so on and so forth. But um, we're just gonna go and finish this off because this is a really important paragraph. And I'll just read it right now. It says, I believe if one does not have a good understanding of what has happened in the past, then they are not equipped to build the future. I believe that if your knowledge of history is just blurbs, little blips about this president, that president, oh, this one was good, and that one was that, or this one was a killer, then if that's your understanding of what is called history, you cannot project the future. To project the future, there must be a profound analysis of what has happened and understand the whys of these various events. Then you are equipped because I believe in studying our story, we capture a light from the past which shines on the road to the future, right? You know, we, we this is one of the things that I'm going to outline in this book, or this is one of the things that you're going to pick up on in this book, that you want to have a profound analysis of what has happened, right? And understand the whys of the various events, you know? Why do the mulattoes get into this position? And why does IT fail as a result? You know, or why does IT fail? You know, a lot of us do not talk about this two-thirds council, you know? A lot of us don't even talk about Petion. But you have to... You have to recognize that this might have been uh, a flaw in, and, and, and it's a, 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 a mistake that we don't want to repeat because what you're going to have is that, like I said, you might have that South African situation where, you know, oh, well, India helps out or China helps out. And then eventually you say, okay, well, we're going to put the Chinese on the council. And you say to yourself, well, who's the most qualified for a national council, right? Or who's more qualified? Uh, you know, if the Chinese send over, you know, 20 experts, right, and there are 30 seats, right, you know what I mean, or, 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 or they send over 100 experts, and there are 30 seats, right, and you want these experts because, you know, one of them is an expert on this, one of them is an expert on that, one of them is, expert, you know, on space travel, and the other one's an expert on uh, mechanical engineering, then, you know, you look at the African pool, and it's like, we're an expert at Twitter or something, and, you know, we're an expert at you know, conversation and Twitter battles and, and debate and colorism and this, that, so on and so forth. And, and you realize, hey, you know what? These, these Chinese might be a lot more qualified than you put on, like, there's 30 people that you can have. And you put, on, you put on 20. You know, you put 20 from the Chinese side and 10 from the African side because, you know, there are 10, you know, like, like one, of the, one of the African people is like a, you know, a you know, bona fide scholar. Or another one's like a bona fide, you know. But, you know, you put the 10, uh, you know, you put the 10 best of the, African side and 20 best of the Chinese side. And then you have a government that's going to... But then you have the emperor. And you say the emperor is going to be an African man. He's going to be a South African man. He's going to be a Zulu man, right? And, but, but there's 20 experts from China, right? And 10 experts from Africa, right? And then the uh, emperor is, is African. And so everything is going pretty good. And then those Chinese kill that African. You understand? And, and so... The Chinese then say, okay, we're going to take over this part of South Africa, and the Africans take over the other part. And then the people on the, on the Chinese side say, we're going to get the assistance of China. You know, we're going, to, we're going to have people pay China for the reparations or whatever, right? We're going to have people like, pay China for how much it invested in this war because you're not paying them fast enough. And, and, it, and it just, like, like that's, that's pretty much what happened. You know, and so you have to say to yourself, and you might say, well, it's common sense. You're not going to, uh, you're not going to do that. But it's not. If you have 20 qualified Chinese people, you're going to have them on the board. You know, like that's common sense. Common sense is to put them on the board. What's uncommon sense is to say, you know what? No, we're going to we're going to try to do this on our own, you know. And if we do include you because you might necessarily have to include them, we're going to put in some sort of like some serious protections. You know, we're going to say you only have five years. You only have this amount of time. You only have this, you know, whatever it is, you're going to have to really sit down and think about that. And, and, you know, as the people who are doing this and and, you know, it's not for me to think about it. It's for you to think about it and, and for you to know to think about it, because right now you're going to find a lot of African businesses. A lot of African corporations have Chinese or American or Italian or British or whatever. They, they have these people on the board of directors. You know, a lot of the corporations in Africa are, <laughs> you know, non-African corporations. You know, you're going to have this. What's important is that we as a people, when we're, as we're moving forward, we say to ourselves, no more of this. Okay? We say to ourselves that we can't keep risking this because 
if it can happen to Dessalines, right? And he's one of the best examples we have from the 19th century, right? If it can happen to Dessalines, it can happen to you, unless you prepare and study and learn from our story. All right. Um, and with that, I bid you all adieu. I thank you so much for listening. And of course, like I said, you know, make sure you go check out Harsh Reality Podcast, you know, KWZ Radio. You know who we are. I'm a bookman, revolutionary matron, and KW Don Seven. I appreciate them all. Make sure you check out all of their channels. And until next time, I want to say Shami Amahotep and, of course, Asante Sana for your time. Uh, Shami Amahotep. <laughs>